Good afternoon, everyone. I am truly honored to be here um, for me and also on behalf of my colleagues. So I want to tell you a little bit about mobile and search and what we're seeing. So first about me, I, as Taco said, I've been at Google for over 11 years. I'm based in Mountain View, California. And uh, my background um, from college was in cognitive science with an emphasis in computer science. And when I'm, I'm a pretty literal person, so when I do an about me slide, I'm showing you my chromosomes. <laughs> so you can know me on the very cellular level. So let me know if you see anything fishy there, because I would like to know. All right, so my entire intention for speaking here is that I, um, first of all, I use WordPress. But also, I went to WordCamp Europe, and I thought the sessions were great. I thought the people were amazing. And I really wanted to just share the knowledge that we have. I thought we could kind of be better together. Um, so it's about sharing the ecosystem love. That's what I'm all about here. Now, we exist in this world with users or readers of blogs or searchers, right? Website owners or business owners, our bloggers, photographers. Um, then there's advertisers and marketers. And then, of course, there's search engines, there's CMSs. Um, and there's many platforms out there. So I think if we can kind of work better, this can be just even better evolved and, again, helping society. So I have four main topics. First, ever-evolving users and technology. Second, how users love speed. Third, seamless, mobile-friendly experiences. And last, we'll touch upon security. All right, so let's start with ever-evolving users and technology. So here's a beautiful photo from China where you can see you know, people are distracted when we're on their phones. So this gives them a separate lane. <laughs> and that's because of the high usage of mobile that we're seeing today. And um, this is evident. I think we know it for ourselves. But ComScore also shows uh, mobile website usage overtaking desktop. Google announced over a year ago that mobile queries globally have surpassed desktop queries. And I mention this because when you think about mobile queries, for those of you that own businesses or own websites, factor local. Because nearly one third of all mobile searches are related to location. And location related mobile searches are growing 50% faster than all mobile searches. It's getting to that hyper local, hyper targeted information. So they're using their mobile phones for exactly what you would expect. But when you think about your brands, I think everything is getting more targeted, more niche, more local. So this is a graph of internet users today. And the intensity of the blue is showing the, the density of those users. So the US is pretty strong. I'm like, what's that, I mean, what's that country there? And I forgot it's Alaska. I was never very good at US history. So <laughs> that's Alaska. It's big. Um, and then, of course, there's China and India looking um, you know, even more blue. And this is who is already online. So these are, many of these people will already know about WordPress, right? They've already visited websites. Um, they've had mobile phones for a while now. The interesting thing to look at, though, is internet users that are not yet online. Those that we're expecting to be the next billion users to come online. And this is going to be in the intensity of red. And you can see how dark India is. You can see China still big. You can see Indonesia, right, and Brazil. And the US, obviously, a much faded pink. So this is the type of user that, when you think about growth, that we're going to look, again, next billion users coming online, right? We're not even there, close to like there yet. So let's just look into India a little bit more here. Um, Hindi, they speak Hindi in India, obviously other places too. But Hindi search queries have tripled from 2002 to 2015. And you saw kind of they're not even yet online, right? Over 65% of India's population is not yet online. That's 864 million potential users still not online from India alone. More than 20x the number not yet online in the US. 864 million just from India. So where do we see kind of deficits here? So we know these users are coming online. Let me show you this chart. Now, if you look on the left-hand uh, side, there's a circle that shows native speakers. I speak English fluently. <laughs> That's all I speak fluently. Um, <laughs> Apparently, English speakers, it's only 3.5% of the native speakers globally. Well, Indic languages, including Hindi, are 4.5%, right? Meanwhile, look at the right side, the circle, the websites by language. English, extremely dominant at 54%, while Hindi and Indic languages are still less than 1% together. They are 0.14% come there. So these users are coming online. Right? We expect them to want to do similar types of things, right? Get information, get entertainment. And yet, we don't have content available there. 
So I say this if you're a website owner, think about your business, but also if you're you know, contributing to WordPress to think about how seamless is our experience for these new site owners that are gonna wanna build a website, right? Is it in their language? Not only is it translated, but you know, um, is the entire flow conducive to the situations that they're in? So I'll cover a little bit more about that. So one thing I wanna mention about uh, users in India, and this is just because I think I'm American, so I'm really you know, in a bubble. <laughs> It's embarrassing. I'm the very typical American. Um, I'm the ones that when they interview like on those shows and they're like, how stupid is that girl? Didn't know the answer to that. I never know those answers. <laughs> I always watch it. I'm like, I don't know. Like who, pre who's vice president? I still don't know. Pence. Pence, I think, right? Yeah. Is it Pence? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know Trump is president, but I don't, yeah, that's, 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 I need help. Okay. So that's a tangent. Can we cut that out of the video? Okay. So anyways. <laughs> What I wanted to show here, this is an ad for Colgate. So good to brush your teeth. Um, now, what, what I wanted to highlight though, is if you've ever been to India, I love India, I spent you know, just over a month there as a tourist a few years ago. Um, there's not a lot of supermarkets and there's a lot of small stores. And in, even in these small stores, as you see with this Colgate ad, they weren't even trying to advertise this. This woman's looking to buy a, a tube of toothpaste, which we all do. But what you see up here is the kind of fun part, I think, about India, which is that, um, in many cases, they don't buy the entire tube. It's fairly expensive, I think. Uh, and so they buy their toothpaste incrementally. So you're looking at like a 25 cent pack of toothpaste that you can buy individually to kind of get by and do that over time. Same is true of many cases of how they view data connectivity. They're not getting two gigs at a time <laughs> or having unlimited data, right? They're using it, these limited budgets that they're paying for. And in fact, the studies show that the data internet connectivity is actually a significant portion of their monthly income. Like, not insignificant. I mean, compared for how it is for many of us. So they're watching their data usage like a hawk because that to them is money. So the size of a web page, that's money, right? And when they get on Wi-Fi, that's when they're trying to just download everything they can because they know once they get away, it's gonna be costly. So that's mobile, but Sundar, the Google CEO, recently said, it's clear to me, we're evolving from a mobile first to an AI first world. So we're just getting our hands, like understanding mobile and now even more is coming. And this is just how things are changing, technology evolving so quickly. So voice recognition. So many of you already know this, but I can do something like, um, uh, do a query like this. Let me just, sorry, I have to unlock my phone. What songs does Ed Sheeran sing? Mem? Ed Sheeran's songs include Thinking Out Loud, Photograph, Give Me Love, and others. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Google. But what is that? Why am I showing you this? It's because voice recognition is 20% of the queries that we see today. The Google app understands languages, uh, 55 languages, and we're trying to get better at English with a Hindi accent. We're trying to get better at how children are speaking because this is everything that's coming online, right? This is the new usage and behaviors that are happening. Um, and that query, what songs does Ed Sheeran sing, Google would have probably given maybe a knowledge card, maybe 10 blue links, just like seven years ago. We wouldn't have had voice to text that way. And today it's completely expected. So you saw me do that query, you're like, yeah, 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 whatever, I've seen that a million times. But know that before we could have taken that as a six string query, six individual strings, not knowing that Ed Sheeran was one person and a singer-songwriter. And that's the expectation that people have today, that we should just be able to answer that. Furthermore, right, with voice, it's not just about information. Um, people wanna do more stuff. Play thinking out loud. When your legs don't work like they used to before. Got it. So they're taking action as well through the search box. So the search box isn't just used to find information, it's used to fully ask questions and be able to be an active agent in their life. Okay, you can do other things, like set an alarm clock for nine o'clock a.m., get directions to the Liberty Bell all through voice. You can open websites. You could say openwordpress.org. And all of this artificial intelligence, machine learning, understanding is important because when we get beyond a mobile phone to things like smart cars, you have a interface for this car completely built around the fact that the user should not have to look at the screen at all. And that's where we're gonna need all of the voice recognition and artificial intelligence to meet that user's needs. Now, um, this seems futuristic to me. I like, 
I used to watch like Knight Rider and stuff, so it's like, whoa, um, it's here, I've got my own kit. Okay, but um, it is here for sure, right? Because there are now over 200 new car models supporting Android Auto, 200 new car models, offered from more than 50 brands. Now, what I want to bring home here is that you still kind of know this paradigm, which is that you can easily access existing features like maps, music, and messaging by just saying, OK, Google, so you can stay focused on the road. So it's not radically different from what we've seen before. We're still using kind of the existing technology that you're familiar with, but we're hitting these new interfaces. Then, of course, there's smart watches, right? Getting just more cool and funky, and we'll see how user behavior adapts to this and integrates throughout their life. Um, there's also home devices. This is my mother who bought an Amazon Echo for the family. I don't live with my mom. When I say family, I mean like my, my immediate family, but not. We don't live together. Um, that's my niece and my sister visiting, and my parents use this every day to play music uh, to get sports scores. So they're completely um, habituated to this. So Google Home also came out, um, and I got a Google Home, and. Um, I have it in one, I use it, I use it constantly. I use it to play songs or a certain Christmas carol I feel like hearing. I use it to get the time always because I'm just so lazy. I can't like look behind a wall to figure out what time it is. Um, and just so you know, I had one device about three weeks ago and I now have three because it was that annoying to be in my bedroom and be like, what time is it? And I was like, oh shoot, I don't want to walk to go see a clock and my phone's out there. I'm talking to my husband and I'm like, I want to hear this. And I'm like, oh, I can't. Where's my phone? I got to go pick up my phone unlock my phone, like it's just too much work. <laughs> um, so I felt like a glutton, and then I talked to my, one of my girlfriends who doesn't work at Google, and I was like, you know, I think I'm really like overspending. I have three home devices. She's like, I have five. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm cool, all right? I, um, I felt really liberated hearing that. Um, but what I'm saying is that, I don't know if you have one yet, but the behaviors are already starting, the habits are already starting to form. Like once you get one, it, it, maybe you won't get started at all, but if you do, it starts to get pretty easy. There's of course chatbots. There's uh, 2.5 million people who use a chat, a chat app on their, um, on their phone. And so you can see how chatbots are kind of that natural evolution of that behavior now into getting their needs met. So chatbots can be used for you know, customer service, to book anything, to book a hotel, to book reservations, call a taxi. Um, and that's kind of moving forward with the next generation of people. So we'll see how this all pans out. Now, Accenture found that digital is the main reason over half the Fortune 500 have disappeared since the year 2000. Staggering. And I think the truth of the matter is that we are still right in the middle somewhere in the digital revolution. Like, this isn't over. We all have to keep evolving constantly, right? If we didn't start doing kind of those voice searches, we'd be in trouble today. And that was just from five years ago. Uh, Carl Honoré, an author, says that we used to dial, now we speed dial. We used to date, now we speed date. And DoubleClick found that 53% of visits are abandoned if a mobile site takes more than three seconds to load. A year ago, I would talk about speed sometimes, and I'd say 40% of visitors will abandon a site that takes longer than 40, four seconds to load. So in just one year, the findings are even more impatient. So Wasta plotted load time with conversion rate. So the red is conversion rate, and you can see how the conversion rate starts to decrease as the page load time gets beyond 15 seconds. The blue bars are showing the population of sessions for that time. So clearly, users prefer something being faster. And that impacts the website owner's metrics. If you look at bounce rate, we see something quite similar. Again, the red is going to show the bounce rate, it getting far lower, right around two to three seconds, and then increasing with load time. Now, you might be wondering why is it so high for those fast loading pages. Uh, Sawasta believes that those are probably error pages or 404s. So they loaded quickly, but then users bounced anyway. Right. So what I want to explain here is that if you're a website owner, because technology is moving so quickly, because users are becoming so impatient and you're fighting for their attention, um, things can get a little desperate and maybe even counterproductive. This is Brad Frost's death to bullshit. He has an entire mantra here where he explains about being bombarded by information. Now, the fun part about this page is that if you click turn the bullshit on, I don't know if you've seen this before, then he makes ads on the page, right? <laughs> and this is actually what we're used to seeing. The great and fun thing about this is that when you're there for just a few second or so, you're then bombarded by an interstitial <laughs> that says, like us on Facebook if you think racism is bad. 
Um, or you can close this window, I am a racist, right? <laughs> but this is getting into the heads of the people who have websites today and what they're having to do to try to get these users. This is obviously not the way we want them to go, but this is a lot of the mental state that they're in. Uh, you know, and then of course if you scroll it says, for the love of God, please like us. And they, they're giving you an option of where you can do that. So Brad points out some great things. And so two takeaways that I liked, especially, I liked all of them, was to respect people and their time. That again gets to speed, right? And the seamless experiences. And then to create genuinely useful things. And that one is especially hard because when we think about customers, searchers, or website owners coming online in these different areas, What's useful to them is going to be substantially different from what we believe is useful, right? We think this is a great onboarding experience. They're like, that just used $5 to me, <laughs> just trying to get that installed. So again, right, being generally useful, it's just going to keep getting harder, and we have to keep thinking about it. Bright Edge, which is a SEO platform um, that helps with content, they said 80% of B2C content, 50% of B2B content is never engaged with. On average, only 33% of content is engaged with on mobile, and only 47% on desktop. So while we may be helping people to create all this stuff, again, with user expectations changing, with a plethora of platforms to go to, right, social networks, or uh, photo sharing, or video, that they're not even sometimes viewing this content. It's just getting put out there and not being consumed. So what does remain constant? All right. Uh, I, these are just from my thoughts. So I have three ideas. So I think customers will always be more connected online. There's not going to be a day where I'm going to you know, say, I don't need my phone anymore. I mean, for a significant amount of time. I might do it for an afternoon. Um, more connected. They want minimal friction, fast and seamless experiences. And then they want increased utility, right? Like as Brad Frost was explaining, whether that's being entertaining, value affirming, personalized, secure, and or informative. So all these things will remain constant as we move forward. It's just that everything's going to be evolving quickly. So let's take a first look at the topic of speed. So Matt Mullenweg said that speed is a feature. So I've quoted him here. Uh, I didn't know he had a beard, so it's new to me. OK. Um, so what has Google done? So what we've looked at is uh, making things faster for searchers. So we have this product called Searchlight. We've turned it on uh, in Indonesia and India for people with slow connections. And this is how bad it was. <laughs> so here's the, there's an entire video, but essentially a user was trying to click from a search result to view uh, Press Times of India, PTINews.com. At 103 seconds before Searchlight, they had no visual feedback that they were going to reach that page. And with Searchlight, they could see that information in 7.5 seconds. So we've done some optimizations and with images as well. But that's the situation they were facing. And yeah, that just came out like a year, two years ago. So that's how it was for them prior to that. OK, almost 60% of mobile traffic is 2G. It's not what we have here in many cases. And if you're thinking, OK, well, maybe it doesn't have to be that fast because mobile networks will get so much better, I don't think we want to wait for that. I'm not even sure it's going to happen. Uh, Twin Prime plotted uh, LTE speeds in the major US cities, 2016 and 2015. 2015 is in pink, and it is much faster in every city last year than LTE speeds are this year in yellow. And that's San Francisco, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles. So how can that be? Well, in many cases, right, if we had a highway and we made the speed limit 120, but we put three times the amount of cars on that highway, things are going to slow down. So that's what we see today. So even in the US, you know, speed can be an issue. So if you want to develop with more real-world condition testing, then you can use Chrome DevTools, where you can specify a, a device much lower end. Yeah, let me say that too, which is that there's pixels out there, there's iPhones out there that are just amazing devices, but the majority of users coming online are at the margin. Their phone is certainly not going to be a pixel, right? It's going to be what the minimum they can do to get information and to, to work. OK, so another thing that we can do to make things faster, and Google is um, supporting this uh, AMP project, um, is Accelerate Mobile Pages, or AMP. There are 600 million AMP pages in the Google, million <laughs> AMP pages in the Google index from 700,000 domains, 230 countries, and over 1,000 languages. So why is it working so well? It's because users love speed. Now, this is the AMP publishing flow, and many of you have seen something like this many times, but what I want to highlight here is a few things. First of all, the CMS, like WordPress is there on the left-hand side, 
Um, and then some of these logos of, of different brands that are using AMP are Financial Times, Guardian, New York Times, and BuzzFeed. And why it works so well with AMP is because these sites often have a lot of majority of static content, not super interactive pages like a, a Google Maps or a Gmail. And that's what AMP is great for. So then they can publish their pages and it becomes extremely fast to the user for three main reasons. One is the AMP HTML format, where I'll show you more about that, then caching, and then pre-rendering. All right, let's start with the format. So unfortunately, we moved from this desktop world of these large, are you serious? I only have 10, from these large pages to, um, to we ported that desktop to mobile. But if we could do it all over again, right, we would have made the mobile pages substantially smaller, not just bring desktop over. And AMP does that. It keeps things much more constrained. Is that for the 45 minutes? I'm sorry, one second. Sorry. Sorry. Just more. Yeah. You're, you're still asking. 25 minutes? OK. Oh, I was going to speed talk, but now I don't have to. OK. So um, it does this because AMP is actually, it, it's, it's a constrained format. And in that, it keeps things really fast. Um, so it, it's got some limitations for the format, but that's what's going to make it quick. And that's what's going to keep you um, able to maintain this over time. So if there are you know, disputes within your uh, company between the marketing team and the design team and the content team, in the end, you're still going to be restrained by that format, which is going to keep you fast. So it's kind of nice to have that, kind of that natural budget in, built in. Then, of course, uh, there's the AMP uh, cache. Um, which brings this information to users much more quickly wherever they are. And then the third way this makes it faster is that AMP is pre-rendered for above the fold content. Now, what we see is that there's an under one second median load time from all AMP pages loaded from Google search. 99% of AMP page loads are faster than eight seconds. And then the non-AMP control loads in 22 seconds on average. So if you were to look at this visually, right, you could hand tune your site and be at the front of the pack. And that could be awesome. <laughs> um, but if you're a site and let's say your developer leaves um, or the culture somehow changes, right, that's really hard to maintain long term. If you use something like AMP, you're automatically kind of at the front of the pack where the average mobile site will be lagging. The Washington Post had some good results with AMP. They found a 23% increase in mobile search users who return within seven days and an 88% improvement in load time from AMP content versus traditional mobile web and they publish over 1,000 articles daily using AMP HTML. So the AMP project, just to let you know, um, I think Google is a loud supporter of it, but it's actually open source. <laughs> just realize that. And there are over 200 contributors currently. Um, and just small, you know, smaller numbers come from Google. You know, way over 100 is from outside the Google uh, employee pool. Then when it comes to AMP and WordPress, so you probably heard there's an AMP plugin for WordPress. Um, that plugin is improving over time. And from WordPress.com, they said that 5.5% of their page views are delivered for, from AMP, and that AMP page views are typically six times faster than standard HTML versions, and their largest VIP clients are delivering up to 10% of their AMP page views via AMP, or their page views via AMP. Okay, so it looks to be doing well. Of course, if you want to know more information, there's uh, AMP information for where it's shown in Google Search, in Google Search Console. So you can see that data there, metrics. And you can also test and see errors within Google Search Console as well to make sure that your format is correct. Now, when it comes to speed, one thing I want to bring up for new sites on the web. So this is sites that we have only discovered content on this domain in the last three months, or since August 28th. WordPress sites load slower than most of the top 10 popular CMSs. So again, we just looked at the new sites coming on the web, so no history here at all. Um, and then we took all their indexed URLs and we ran PageSpeed Insights against all those indexed URLs and then ranked them. And WordPress is on the slower end of the top 10. So I think it's a really big opportunity here. Um, again, you saw the user needs that are out there as well as the developer and website owner needs. Okay, so we can work together. Um, now, the next topic I wanted to bring up was mobile-friendly seamless experiences. So you probably heard about our mobile-friendly update a couple years ago, right? And that was just giving users the bare minimum of what they expected, <laughs> that they didn't want a desktop site when they landed on search results. So today, thankfully, 85% of mobile results um, are mobile-friendly. 
But the next thing that we have coming is on January 10th, 2017, is the intrusive mobile interstitials update. Now, why are we doing this? Again, because users have higher expectations and they do not want to have, coming from search results, something that is fully blocking their workflow or the content on the page. So those pages, individual pages, will be demoted in Google search when they have a, a significant blocking interstitial. No. <laughs> you know, this is not, and we're not trying to do this, again, um, to enforce anything as much as we're just trying to make sure that users are getting what they expect today. So a good thing you can do, all right? So interstitial's not so great when they block the full content, but a great thing is progressive web apps, or PWAs. And if you haven't heard of this, this is different from AMP um, in that it's working off of the platform of your browser, whether that browser's Chrome, Firefox, Opera, not yet Safari, though. And progressive web apps can take a mobile website and give it what we call superpowers, right? The ability to work offline, um, which would be especially important in places like Indonesia and India, to send push notifications, or to add an icon to the home screen, all from the mobile website, right, without that cumbersome process of having to go download the app and install it. So it does this um, through service workers and different information, but what we're seeing today is in the last year, 50,000 domains are using push today, and the ones that are doing well are seeing definite success. Uh, Beyond the Rack found a 26% average increase in spend that occurred from members who visited via push, and 72% more time spent on site per visit from members who visited via push notifications. So it's making kind of these mobile websites even more powerful. So if you're wondering how does AMP and PWA, how is this all gonna play together? Well, we think that they're actually complementary. Now the ideal, let's just have a, a situation where a user searches for fleece hoodie in Google search or from, from any search engine. Um, they can click on a result and that can load the AMP page, right? And that's gonna load in like under a second and largely static, static content, because it's just product listings. And when that P, um, AMP page loads, in the meantime, all the service workers can then kick off. And when a user clicks, um, let's say, on one of the hoodies, that then is going to bring them to a PWA experience, where the user can then start to work offline or to receive push notifications or to be prompted for that. So we see this all part of a much better mobile web, right? Not the big, clunky desktop web brought over, but one that's really going to work with users' expectations. Another area I wanted to cover uh, with respect to these seamless experiences is structured data. And structured data is what's powering the rich snippets, or in this case, the rich cards that you see when you do recipes or when you see reviews in search results. And the structured data, um, here's a testing tool, but it illustrates we just take the open code that's on a web page that any search engine can use, or Yandex or any application, look for the structure, and then find things like the recipe or the breadcrumb to display. So we look and we see schema.org slash nutrition information, right? There's nutrition, there's the calories, and we extract that information and that's how it's all displayed. And we want to use this for even more powerful ways um, and for more types of schemas. So right now, um, you can't really see it there, but we have it for uh, breadcrumbs, for uh, logos, for social profiles, for articles, courses, music, of course, recipes, and it just goes on. And again, this is open markup that anyone can use. Now, um, to see the rise in structured data, I compared it with noindex, which is a common um, search word used to not have a page display in search results, which is always going to be fairly constant. You can see structured data is increasing in popularity, more popular now than noindex. Um, and another one I wanted to mention was hreflang. So hreflang is just link, rel alternate, href the URL, hreflang, language and country code, or just language code if you want. And we use this, again, to provide these more seamless experiences. It's totally open. It's either on your sitemap or on the page itself in the head of the document. And what it helps us with is if a searcher comes from on Google.ca, we make sure, given that markup that the website owner has provided, that they get the Canadian version of that page. So you don't necessarily just have to have a CCTLD, but you can have this markup that helps Yandex, it helps Yahoo, any search engine, to make sure that the right version is displayed to users. Again, totally open markup. And hreflang has also taken off, right, in just the last two years, um, as more businesses want to go global. Another thing we have with Google, we've announced that we're testing and we will eventually roll out to a mobile-first index. So uh, a decade ago, when I first came to Google, right, it was just a desktop index. And then it was a desktop index um, with mobile pages, but the desktop version was the canonical version that we indexed. The content all came from the desktop version. Moving forward, if a mobile version exists, that will become the primary version of the content that we index. 
Um, so it's still an index of web and app URIs, right? With stuff we find, and we're still going to have multiple Googlebots, images, uh, desktop crawlers, mobile phone crawlers. Um, but because mobile searches, they want the freshest, most accurate information, we need to get that off of that mobile page. Okay, so that's our mobile index. Um, already being tested, and it's going to be coming soon. So for new sites on the web, WordPress's percentage of new mobile-friendly sites are in the top five of the popular CMSs. Congrats. 23% lower than the mobile-friendly CMS leader. So this, of course, I'm just saying it's for new sites on the web. It's not for those that had, all have to change templates or change themes. Completely new sites are still, in many cases, choosing, not many, but in some cases, choosing a desktop-only theme. So we can improve that, too, hopefully. So the last topic is security. Now, I want to follow up on something from WordCamp Europe, where um, Aaron Campbell, is that total time? Oh, OK. Ooh, all right. Where Aaron Campbell mentioned, hey, you know, spammer, he, Aaron Campbell works with security and was saying that spammers are using Google to actually find exploits. Uh, they know about an exploit, and they do an in-URL query to find what domains have that vulnerable plugin installed, and then go through that list and exploit them. So he's like, can you um, just totally no index uh, wp-content slash themes and plugins? And I was like, oh, I'm going to go try. So we went, and unfortunately, um, we will see a content loss. Uh, we find that some of these themes and plugins are using those files and those directories to actually display content in galleries and such. So we're not able to do it. But I just use this as an example of, if you have ideas of how you think Google Search can help you, you know, we're all ears and trying to work together about this. So let's talk about security in terms of HTTP. So what does it mean? Um, it means hypertext transfer protocol. But it would also mean, <laughs> is that a, a, a hacker is able to view that connection and potentially steal things like credit card information or usernames and passwords. It also means that HTTP, that um, a user isn't guaranteed that they're actually going to go to the site that they believe that they are, even if the URL matches, right? The hacker can actually impersonate that site. It also means that the server can send information, the website owner can send information that can then be like uh, snooped and modified by the hacker so that the user sees something different. So HTTP, while we all know and love it, what we really love is HTTPS, right? We love HTTP with TLS. So the good news is that more than 50% of pages loaded and two-thirds of total time spent by Chrome desktop users occur via HTTPS. So this is a very positive note. Um, but we want to keep this even um, better than that, right? So coming in Chrome 56, uh, which is coming in January, we're going to label not secure for websites uh, for some websites that are HTTP and are asking, we believe, for credit card or password information. So users will start to see this not secure icon. The good news is that we're going to highlight secure sites. So you'll see the green uh, padlock with the word secure. Now, the reason why we now have the word secure there, if you haven't seen, it's a really fun wired article that talks with our uh, security team, is that one of our engineers went home and she had a, a hoodie with a padlock, because she works on Chrome security. Um, and it said, Department of uh, Chrome Land Security. And her sister was like, why do you have that purse on your hoodie? <laughs> Again, gets back to this bubble that we're in, right? that we really have to get out of, understand users better. So that's why we're explicitly saying the word secure now. Our hope is that the eventual treatment for all HTTP sites will say not secure. We can't do this today, because obviously users become kind of blind to it, or just habituate to seeing it. But eventually, one day, we would love to have this for HTTP. For new sites on the web, WordPress sites are more likely to be HTTPS than sites from other popular CMSs. Yay! So these are for new sites. It's double digits. It's still below, way below 50%, but it's, it's yay. OK. Um, <laughs> so progress can be made, but you're already doing great, too. And then HTTPS, just to know, will be a requirement for so much of the cool stuff coming forward, right? Because users are expecting more and more. It's already a requirement for PWAs, for service workers. For um, AMP functionality, once you get outside the standard text and images of AMP, you can do that in HTTP. But once you want to go beyond that, um, you're going to need HTTPS. And then for the cool stuff you can do on websites in the future, like geolocation, microphone, and camera, that will be HTTPS required. And you can imagine why, right? We don't want a, a website rogue hacker to be able to affect a user that way if it's not HTTPS. So just to sum up, we're in this together. All right, users and uh, technology are quickly evolving. But I think there's huge opportunities in terms of speed 
seamless mobile-friendly experiences, as well as security. So there's just a few minutes for Q&A, but thank you so much for having me here, and I'm, I'm going to be around here tomorrow, too. I was kind of saying this, but I'm here at Contributor Day, so I'm here on Sunday, too. So if you didn't get it asked, you can ask it tomorrow. Hi. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, how you're working with advertisers to handle both the HTTPS, because they like to send non-encrypted mm -hmm. ads, and how you're working with them for uh, AMP and AMP for ads, because uh, non-AMP compliant, non-AMP for ads, or ads for AMP compliant ads serve so much slower than uh, compliant ads. Yeah, there's a lot, so there's people on that in terms of making ads secure. Um, because if you have a HTTPS page, you believe, but you're serving insecure resources, like images or ads, it's no longer secure. So it's, it's totally being worked on. It's, it's like it's works? a priority, okay, yeah. <laughs> so we're, thank you for that, but know that we are. It's on our. Howdy, my name is Jameson. I'm with Cloudflare. I'm a technical support team lead. Uh, we are moving into a phase where language support is becoming a critical factor in our support organization and the entire business. Um, obviously, you don't have 55 people that are just experts in the language programming the AI, but um, is, is the Google language kind of going to turn into a platform? Do you have any advice for companies that are looking to expand the languages that they support uh, on their, their you know, base dub, dub, dub properties, et cetera? Um, oh, they can't hear that microphone? Yeah, if you can do that. Okay, okay. So he's wondering if Google has more kind of like translate technology that we can make available so that more businesses can support a more worldwide audience. Correct. Okay. Um, let, a, a few caveats on that. So uh, I believe, you know, I don't know the Google Translate team that well, but I would say this is that when people expand, expand their business globally, just translations in many cases are not enough. Because once you get exactly into that support question, it gets into having the bar is raised, right? In the same way, uh, many Americans complained when they had to work with you know, some support person in another country where English was their second language. Same thing is true here. So I hope the technology gets there. But at the same time, be aware of how you're expanding and making sure that you can still serve that customer through the entire life cycle, right? Because once they make that purchase and then have a support issue, you want to do that well so that then they repurchase or they tell your friends about it. So just that initial sale, I think, is, is short-term thinking. You've got to think about the whole support. Agreed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a local web designer and uh, SEO person. And I, I, I noticed that when I searched the internet, I only see AMP pages for, or AMP for, uh, for news articles or blog posts. When will, when will none blog posts uh, show up as AMP? Uh, I guess AMP. When will AMP results be sh none blog posts show up as AMP? OK, yeah, good question. So. Um, oh, <laughs> do you want to repeat it? Because I am talking. I'm sure you are tired of hearing my voice. And I, okay. <laughs> okay, so he's asking um, that he sees AMP a lot for news and for blogs. Yeah. When is it going to come out for stuff other than those two? Mm -hmm. Or to start seeing it search results? Correct. Okay, it's totally available in search results for any type of content that, that's in AMP. Mm -hmm. But again, getting back to the idea that AMP is best for more static content, which gets to be news and blogs. Um, that's why it's, there. it's so we will show an AMP version of a, a web page. We'll prefer that, and we'll show that in search results. It's just currently, in, in terms of website owners, they're only doing it when they have blogs or news, for the most part. Okay. Um, actually, eBay has over nine million pages. I think that they did an AMP for their e-commerce. But okay, for example, for like service pages, won't they won't like Google won't be showing AMP results, right? Or, Wait, service pages? Yeah, like for example, if you type in. Atlanta web design, like I noticed that no, you don't see AMP results in the... Oh, AMP. but that's because no one's designed an AMP page. If okay. you wanted to do that, you would have a little lightning bolt next to yours. Okay. okay. Um, Fine, thank you. Next person, please. Hi, um, my name's Anne. Um, I work with a lot of clients outside the US. 
um, and trying to get them onto Google Maps and their Google business profiles has mm -hmm. proven challenging at many steps along the way, um, especially in countries that don't use street addresses. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that and any efforts that you guys were trying to do if you're looking to expand into the non-English speaking market and the non-US market, um, what you guys are going to be doing to help facilitate um, business verification, uh, et cetera. Thank you. Got it. Do I have to repeat that? I think that came out really clearly. Really? Yeah, they, they <laughs> Oh, that's painful. Maybe you guys should just talk next time. Just tell the line right here and then talk it. Okay, so she asked, what are we doing for, um, she's helping a lot of businesses outside the U.S. and they may not even have a street address. So what do you do with a Google business account when they're trying to verify and you don't even have an address? And is Google doing anything about that? Um, we have teams dedicated to looking at uh, kind of these type of situations. I'm not super tight with the, the Maps team or the Google My Business team. So I can't speak to that. I, I, I'm just a search. But I will take that feedback back, but I'm, I'm sure that that's, that's being looked at. All right, so this question is actually from Twitter, from Perez Box. He says, uh, so you're, you're saying oh, that- Oh, Tony? The, yes, Tony. Oh, uh, okay. So you're saying that sites are going to be marked as secure because they're HTTPS, but what oh, if they're- I know what he's going to say. I know what not he's actually saying. secure. They're hosting malware. They're running out of date software, that kind of thing. Do you think that showing secure and not secure is going to get a false sense of security just because they're running SSL? Um, gotcha. So thank you, Tony. I don't know if you guys know Tony. I think he's done some great work. I really appreciate his reports. Um, what I would say is this. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be a false sense of security, but I will say that w Chrome is still not going to stop trying to label pages. You've seen those blocks where it says this site you know, might be controlled by a hacker or it might be ho hosting malware. So we're still going to be working on all, all fronts like that. And I appreciate Tony's diligence, and I appreciate his attention to detail. So I'll bring this back to Parissa and to the Chrome security team. Tony, if you hear me. Um, <laughs> absolutely. So thank you for being a watchdog for the community. I appreciate it. Well, we do have time for a final question. So if you ever wanted the chance to really ask Google a question in person, <laughs> this is your chance, right? And not the voice search, but an actual answer. I'll go. OK. Thank yeah. you for this. Yeah. Um, I, I was struck a little earlier by something that you said that involves my nine-year-old. Like, I walked into his bedroom the other day, and he was asking Google something on his iPad. Yeah. And I thought, huh, what, what are you asking about? Um, <laughs> how, how do, <laughs> right? <laughs> He's, he's nine and precocious. Uh, so yeah, I have a two-year-old who says, Google, sen Santa. I'm like, <laughs> right. Nice so, try. Yeah, we just giggle, but yeah, I mean. Yeah. Well, uh, aside from giggling, what, what's your advice? <laughs> On about controlling how to your kid's behavior? <laughs> well, I think about how to uh, maintain a safe environment for the kids while they're learning these new technologies. Like, does Safe Search filter out words if the if the okay. app has, you know, parental yeah. stuff turned on? Um, yes, and there's a big effort within Google to just make YouTube safer to do all these things for kids. And uh, you know, historically Gmail had like it'd be 13 or something to have a Gmail account. And all these. So we're trying to figure out how you, they can interact with all of our services and still in a, a very safe way. So Teams on, and you know, my former boss is actually on that. So. Thank you. Thank you, guys.